Uh, so I was going to talk about the small sport and molecular sub-entities and then realised that actually that would basically then scoop every other talk that's coming up for the rest of the session. So I'm not going to do that. I'm going to give a sort of uh, starter plate of LGG, a couple of bits and pieces that have come up over the last few years. And then for the uh, main course, we've got the rest of the session coming up later on this morning. So, really don't need to uh, spend long on the introduction for this audience, but just to say that low-grade gliomas, we're really talking about the most common brain tumour in children, and that this group taken together is about a third of all brain tumours uh, under the age of 15. And it's, uh, it's an umbrella term, there's a lot of different histological entities that fall into this category of low-grade glioma. Um, the majority of them are pilocytic astrocytoma, um, pilomyxoid astrocytoma, which in the latest WHO classification is now uh, rather considered a variant of PA rather than a separate entity, and the grade has been taken away, so these are no longer considered to be grade 2. And then we have things like ganglioglioma, the Sagas, angiocentrics, and then things which I think should not be considered um, true low-grade glioma in a pediatric sense, things like pleomorphic xanthoastrocytoma and the rarer diffuse astrocytomas. So what we've known for a while um, is that there's a very, very high frequency of MAP kinase signaling pathway alterations in pretty much all of these tumours, but particularly within the pilocytic astrocytomas. And prior to the NGS era, we knew that in around about 70 to 80% of those cases, we could find some kind of MAP kinase alteration, whether it was the classical BRAF fusion gene, BRAF mutation, or NF1, but there was still this uh, subpopulation of cases which were unexplained at that stage. Now we've had several large uh, next generation sequencing based studies coming through and it's really made it clear that pretty much 100% of the cases, uh, again particularly for PA but also for some of those other low grade gliomas, can be explained by some kind of alteration in this signaling pathway. And we really expanded the, the breadth of the types of alteration that we're seeing, so not just in this core uh, ras raf uh, nf one part of the pathway, but really up, extending upstream to seeing some other uh, gene fusions and mutations or small duplications of the kinase domain of FGFR1, for example. And that, again, that's something we're going to uh, hear about in more detail later on. But apart from um, that broad recognition that really a single pathway is the, the major driver of this disease, I think we're also starting to uh, think about these in a slightly more nuanced way and see some of the other factors which are um, collaborating or cooperating with those changes to provide more of a diversity within low-grade glioma. So one example is the fact that MAP kinase pathway alterations are not distributed um, evenly across different locations of where these tumours arise. So in the cerebellum, for example, the vast majority of the tumours harbour the uh, classical Kia BRAF fusion, but when you get outside of the cerebellum, the relative proportion of these other rarer alterations, the BRAF mutations, the KRAS mutations, the FGFR1, starts to increase. So there's clearly uh, a link here between some of the environment, the cellular origins, and the, the susceptibility of those cells to uh, very specific alterations within this signaling cascade. That's also recapitulated both on an ex gene expression and a DNA methylation level, that we know now that the supertentorial and the infratentorial tumours can be split based on this unsupervised look at either methylation or expression. And again, I think that's telling us something about um, how the interaction of the cell of origin with the molecular hit on top are uh, cooperating to drive the oncogenesis within these tumours. So uh, one other uh, aspect that we've known about for a while is this high degree of aneuploidy, but particularly in older patients, where above the age of 16, you're much more likely to see these copy number profiles with gains of whole chromosomes um, across uh, various different chromosomes. Um, but when we now take a, a much 
larger series and look at this in more detail, it's again clear that adult pilocytic astrocytoma display this pattern much more frequently than the pediatric cases, and it's certainly not a random distribution of the chromosomes which are affected. So you see chromosomes 5, 6, 7 here, and 11 are, are much more commonly altered in these amyloid cases than some of the other chromosomes. And there are some which are really very, very rarely uh, altered to the point at which they're significantly de enriched for alterations. <coughs> so we look to see whether um, this phenotype correlates with any other factors. And what you can actually find is that um, far more strikingly than uh, looking at differences in age or location, the difference in uh, expression between aneuploid and diploid cases is quite marked. And just pointing out two of the genes here, PLK2 and MDM2, uh, where you see this very, very um, clear difference in expression. And interestingly, PLK2 is on chromosome 5, which is one of those chromosomes most frequently affected by this trisomy. Uh, but it's certainly more than just a simple dosage effect. And it might be one of the reasons that's driving this uh, enrichment for gain of chromosome 5. And one additional aspect, um, again, that we've known about for a while, but we're now trying to investigate in more detail and really try to um, find out exactly how this is impacting on the biology of these tumours, is this phenomenon of oncogene-induced senescence. So again, where you have um, sort of constitutive, relatively low activation of the MAP kinase pathway over a long period, there's a feedback mechanism within the cell called oncogene-induced senescence, which switches off the growth of cells in response to MAP kinase signaling activation. And although this is generally a tumor suppressive mechanism, and it might be one of the reasons why these low-grade gliomas are relatively benign in their clinical behavior, it's also part of the reason why they might be relatively more resistant to standard chemotherapy, which work a lot better on uh, dividing and proliferating cells. So again, when you look at this in culture, you can see that very, very rapidly, these um, primary cultures of low-grade gliomas uh, undergo oncogene-induced senescence and show this uh, beta-galactosidase staining, and that's coupled with upregulation of classical cell cycle regulators such as P21, uh, P16, and some other markers, which very quickly switch off the proliferation of those cells and are a block to being able to culture these cells in vitro. However, um, the work of uh, Florian Zelt in the lab of Olaf Witten Heidelberg is now trying to establish a way to get around this OIS process by introducing an inducible large T antigen. And when you do that, you can uh, nicely switch on the expression of this large T, as indicated here by the RFP that also gets switched on at the same time. And this temporarily bypasses this OIS system, which allows you to cultivate those cells. And you can see here that um, this model, which harbors the, um, the most common 16-9 variant of the BRAF fusion, also shows very nice MAP kinase pathway signaling activity. And when you uh, switch the system on, the cells proliferate and will divide. But without this induced large T, they maintain their, that senescence profile and don't uh, proliferate in vitro. So we think that this is one way of generating now a, a new generation of models that we can use for preclinical testing for this disease. And then for the, the last section, I want to look at briefly at some of the clinical correlates that we're also starting to see now. So not just um, cataloging the genetic changes, but really see how they might affect the biology of these tumours in terms of other clinical features. So we collected a, a large series of cases within the framework of the COPLGG from a lot of different contributing institutions. And we saw some very, very clear molecular clinical correlates within that. So for example, the infant cases here are actually rather rare in the cerebellum and are much more likely to be in these uh, harder to resect midline supertentorial regions. And you can also see in terms of histology, so the dark green is what was called a diffuse astrocytoma and this middle green was called pilomyxoid. 
So you can again start to appreciate that in the infant tumours, there might be more uh, diagnostic uncertainty about exactly what these tumours are. They're not looking uh, always like typical pyrocytic astrocytoma. So that then maps onto the fact that if you look at the um, youngest age group of patients, they have a worse PFS, and that's been known for quite some time. But I think that quite a large proportion of that uh, is the fact that within this group, not only are you enriching for the particular regions which anyway have a, an inferior PFS because of accessibility to surgery, but you're also enriching for other um, histological oddities in there which might not truly represent what we should consider as a classical low-grade glioma. So to uh, mention BRFB 600E, we know that this does occur in PA, it's common in ganglioglioma, and it's also common in pleomorphic xanthoastrocytoma. But from the series we've had uh, within the true molecular PAs, there was no evidence that the BRFB 600E mutated tumours were doing worse than the tumours with other alterations in that pathway. And conversely, if you look at tumours which were originally histologically diagnosed as a glioblastoma, what we see is that almost all of the cases in that series uh, which harbour a V600E mutation uh, actually fall rather into a group of either PXA-like or LGG-like tumours. And within this series, uh, whether you look at the BRAF wild type or the BRAF B600E cases, the tumours which look like PXA molecularly are doing much worse than the tumours which look like a true molecular lobe glioma. So the true biological glioblastoma with B600E is extremely rare, and even in cases where it looks histologically like a glioblastoma, we have other molecular evidence that actually is behaving more like a, a low grade or a PXA. And without question, we know that BRF E600E inhibitors work. They definitely show a very clear response. And I still wholeheartedly agree that we should consider to make this a standard of care, possibly for all V600E positive gliomas. But I think when we're starting to see some of the uh, case reports and studies coming out now, we just have to be careful of comparing survival of V600E positive hybrid glioma with a very, very uh, typical standard glioblastoma. And I personally think that we should uh, really try to uh, identify these PXA-like tumours in a more precise way and take these out of this umbrella basket of low-grade glioma. Um, at the moment that's a challenge because they show um, when we look at the histological pattern of the tumours molecularly falling into this group, it's a much wider spectrum than has currently been recognised. And they also fall into this clinical trial sort of grey zone where some of the PXAs are being included in the low grade trials and some of the PAs when they got called anaplastic are then being included into the high grade trials. So it's hard to really draw any clear um, conclusions about the, the usual outcome of those tumours. So this was uh, just a summary of what was going to be the smallest board part, and I said I'm going to really leave that up to the very good speakers who are coming after me for the rest of this session. But just to uh, briefly note that um, a variety of different groups are now reporting a much wider spectrum of genetic alterations in these divergent LGG subtypes than we've previously acknowledged. So FGFR is one of the most striking, mid and mid L1 in some of the angiocentrics and the NTRAC fusions in low grade and high grade tumours. And it's already uh, nicely been shown that the molecular fingerprints that those uh, genomic alterations go along with can be identified. So this was uh, uh, methylation data from the St. Jude's group that if you look at the genetic alteration on the top line here, you can see that that's very nicely uh, matching these clusters that you see in the methylation data. And to some extent, they do also match with the pathology. For some, it's clearer than others. But it's certainly not a one-to-one, -one, that uh, one histological pattern matches one alteration, matches one molecular profile. So there's still a little bit more precision to be gained here. <coughs> So where do I think that some of the directions we're going with this in the future? Um, one of those major questions is how can we further deconvolute this molecular heterogeneity within what we're calling low-grade glioma as a basket? 
And I think that stratification based on a combination of those key molecular alterations combined with the histological picture is going to be the way forward. And again, this is uh, just showing some of our DNA methylation data now. This is uh, not quite as beautiful as the data that Paul was showing for the medullos yesterday, but Paul's better looking than me anyway, so that fits. Um, and you can see that there's, again, some of these little islands of DNA methylation nicely falling with the histological groups. But I think if we now go back and try to superimpose the genetic alterations on here, we'll get a much clearer picture than if we purely rely on histology. So what we're starting to do is look at that in a prospective manner, starting a study called Molecular Neuropathology 2.0, where we do DNA methylation and uh, gene panel sequencing for all newly diagnosed brain tumors across Germany. To date, we've had around about 60 low-grade gliomas uh, included in that series, and they're really reflecting this wide spectrum of molecular alterations that we're now starting to expect. And by doing this for all newly diagnosed patients, we can start to get an unbiased view of how frequent some of these alterations are in the different groups, and then have the very good clinical annotation to see how those groups are performing in terms of their outcome. <coughs> I just briefly want to mention another project that we're uh, contributing to at the moment to look at differences in how NF1-related low-grade glioma uh, might sort of diverge from some of their sporadic counterparts. We're now trying to identify molecular risk factors and model this NF1-related disease to see how it correlates with the sporadic tumors, which is led by Michael Fisher and David Goodman. And this is really quite a, an integrative approach to look at the genomics and the models and then doing a the preclinical. And here we really desperately need um, more samples, especially fresh frozen material from NF1 altered low grade gliomas. So if you have any of those cases where you'd be willing to contribute material on a collaborative basis, then please get in touch with Michael Fisher in Philadelphia. And then lastly, um, I, I think that this is one of the most satisfying slides to see now from my perspective as a biologist who's been working and looking at the genetics of this disease for more than 10 years, to see that we are really starting to bring this into uh, a very clear um, clinical trial benefit that we hope is going to lead to improved um, quality of life for these patients. And this is the upcoming logic study that will be run uh, certainly across Europe and perhaps also now we're learning maybe a bit wider a field. And the aim of this study is to uh, randomize already in this first stage uh, two different standard chemotherapy regimes, but also importantly bringing this MEK inhibitor very, very early into this uh, phase three trial setting. And we've fortunately got uh, some funding to do the molecular profiling of some of these um, frozen tissues. So the vast majority of these patients will also have uh, fresh tissue collected. So it will be a, a huge and invaluable resource to learn about the response of different subgroups within this um, umbrella term and how they uh, respond clinically and how different subsites might also differentially respond to MEK inhibitors. <coughs> so I just wanted to end with a couple of uh, more or less controversial statements as a basis for discussion. Uh, some of these I've shown evidence for and some not, but I think that there is very little biological difference between uh, DNAT ganglioglioma and cortical PA, and it may be clinically of minimal relevance. And for all of these low-grade tumors, it's now likely that it would be better to stratify them by a combination of genetic alteration with the histology, not purely stick to these histological buckets. I think what people have been calling anaplastic ganglioglioma and PXA are rather part of the histological spectrum of one biological entity, and these, I feel, should not be considered as low-grade gliomas. Um, and also, when we look at those infant tumors, it's clear that there's something slightly unusual going on there, but we've seen examples recently of infant tumors with a relatively high KO67 index, which otherwise look classically like a true pilocytic low-grade glioma. And I think that in these very young patients, a higher proliferation does not necessarily indicate a malignancy, and we have to be really careful about considering the grading for these tumors. 
And the relatively poor outcome of these infant patients uh, is at the moment confounded by a higher degree of diagnostic uncertainty, a greater proportion of as yet undescribed new entities, and other correlating factors about where those tumours arise and the accessibility uh, to surgical resection. So I want to stop there and thank um, a lot of people who've contributed to this, particularly uh, Stefan for being uh, my mentor and supervisor over the past few years, and a lot of very, very good collaborators who've contributed to this discussion and to the data. So thank you very much.